All right, what's next, Jack? All right, I like to bolt the rest on next. I get all the heights and everything just kind of roughed in close, and then I start working on my loop height and all that okay. good stuff. So I saw you brought several rests. Yes. Um, if you don't care, grab that Freak Show from AAE. Okay. Um, Freak Show, you know, named after Jesse Broadwater. I know Jesse's a Freak. good guy. Uh, there's a couple things I like about this rest. It's got a little longer uh, mount on it, and if we have to, we can slide it back a little bit and move it forward okay. in case we start, you know, kind of torque testing the bow, and it has a little more of a sweet spot. We can go into that in more detail later on, but you'll often see a lot of a lot of shooters. They'll have their rest positioned in different places behind their hand. Sure, that's the reason for it. So a rest like this makes it easy. Let's just go this Sweet. route. Cool. Sharp looking bow, they uh, they did well. I'm telling you what, man, the finish on these things is amazing. And now you know why it takes so long to get your orders when you custom order these things because these are not just freaking dipped in a tank. <laughs> you no. know what I mean? Um, no. It's, I mean the 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 glimmer in the pearl, and I, you know, the glimmer that's on that on that purple is just. When you actually look at it, you'll notice that, that there is metal flake in this. Yeah. I mean, it's a custom option, and it, and it is, it's sharp. There's no doubt. Now, from what I've seen so far on on uh, some of the Hoyts I've been working with, sliding the rest back just a little bit. I get a little more forgiveness out of. You see a lot of guys try to just slide it as far forward as they can, and on okay. some bows, some setups, maybe that's the best way to go. But on the ones that I've worked with thus far, I kind of like it slid back just a little. So let's go ahead and start with it here and just see where we're at to begin with. And you're just basically running off a center shot right now just to get started? Or do you have... Right now I'm, I'm adjusting pitch on the blades and... Now what do you... It, it, this is something that you know comes up quite a bit actually. As far as what have you found to be an, an optimal pitch height um, for what you've, from what you've experienced? Not, not I'm hearing the... anything from 28 to 30. And not not to sound dumb, sure. I never really try to measure the angle. It's just I can kind of look at it and I get a good idea. Okay. You know, like uh, something about that angle, about eh, 35, 40 maybe if I was guessing an angle. But okay. um, There's an app for that, by the way. Like, like, like right there, that's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not a bad angle right there. That's getting me... That's getting me close, maybe even up just a hair. And I think for, for a lot of folks, some of it depends on how big an arrow they're shooting, how big the veins are. If you get this too flat, your veins can end up contacting one side of the bar. So you're going to have to keep it up to a certain level, but it's, uh, it's just kind of a feel. You don't want the blade looking like it's standing straight up in the air. You see some rests out there, right. the blade does look like it's up like it. You don't, you don't really want that, and, and you see every, every rest blade's got a, a thousandth of an inch on it. And yeah, I'm sure you, you put a, a mic on it, it's going to come out to that. But they react very, very differently when you get one with a blade as long as, say, this AAE, and then you take a really short, short blade, like, uh, like on all trophy takers. And I've had really great luck with trophy takers over the years. So um, it just totally depends. Sure. Now, what is the preference of, of going with a 10,000th blade or a 12 or an 8? Um, for what we're doing, like what would you what would you run for an indoor setup? Even though you're not a dot guy, it, it depends on the weight of the arrow, or maybe um, well, first off, on our blade teeth width, just yeah. the diameter of the arrow. Some guys can't keep a 27 diameter arrow on a super thin blade. They may have to go to the wider wider tooth stance. But as far as as blade thickness, a lot of it's tuned. And there's a general chart that says all oh, up to I don't know 300 grains. Maybe use sure. an eight and three to 
four, use a 10, and above four, use something else. But a lot of guys, they may go beyond that. A lot of guys may be shooting an eight, 900 grain arrow for Vegas. Mm -hmm. They may even cut a backer behind this one to add extra stiffness to support the weight of the arrow. And then you can just trim that backer to the point that you can adjust how much bend, how much flex you got in the blade to get the right tune. Most all these folks are doing it for tune. Sure. You know, if you have an arrow that consistently throws knock high, knock high, knock high, and you've adjusted the cams properly, you know, you've, uh, you, you've tied a little longer tie underneath the loop, little things to try to bring the arrow down in the rear end. If that hasn't worked, you could soften your blade up. And then exactly opposite. If you've got an arrow that keeps smashing low and smashing low and you've tried to give the arrow some lift, you, you might end up uh, stiffening that blade up, putting a heavier blade, maybe putting even more backer to help, help kind of resist it. So you can help tune your system with your blade. Cool. I have been engineered to be launched from today's high performance shooting equipment. I must withstand and deliver over 80 foot pounds of energy, shot after shot after shot. Powering through hide, flesh, and even bone. From the tournament trail to the trail head. When I return to my quiver, I'm still straight. I am Gold Tip, the toughest arrow you will ever shoot. Okay, Jack, I see that we have busted out the old school square. Yeah, there are, <laughs> I'm old school. <laughs> listen, there are lasers, there's levels, there's, sure, all there's bubbles. Kinds, yeah. yeah, all kinds of things. And you're using the old fashioned tried and true square. Yeah. Why? Well, um, I always like everything to come back to a fixed reference point, if that makes sense. So I'm going to snap a bow square on, and the bottom of the bow square actually represents the bottom of the arrow. There is the zero line on a bow square. So the bottom of the bow square simulates the zero line. Which simulates what part of the arrow? On the, the very arrow? bottom of the arrow. Okay. For me. It okay. depends on how you want to reference off of it. For me, I want the bottom of the bow square to simulate the bottom of my arrow. Okay. So if I bring my bow square down, and I bring it down until I can just see the bottom of my, of my burger buttonhole. Just see the bottom of my burger buttonhole underneath the bow square. When I get this system built, I'm going to have the bottom of my arrow approximately in the bottom of the burger buttonhole. All that is is just a rough starting point since I know that Hoyt designed the bow in theory that they kind of thought you were going to shoot the arrow center of the arrow through the center of the burger buttonhole, roughly. So if I put the bottom of the bow square to where I can just see into the bottom of the burger buttonhole. I'm going to call that my zero mark. I'm now going to move up from that. I'm going to go ahead and install your loop and get that part started. I just wish I could find one place that has everything I need in archery. Is that too much to ask? Dad, just go to LancasterArchery.com. They have everything. I am just a baby. Just a baby. All right, now we're getting ready to install your loop. And on, on so many different bow and arrow setups, you see so many different kinds of loops. Like some folks will have just a loop. Well, that's okay. But sometimes if you take a good look at your loop, you know, it's not even all the way around. When I snap an arrow in there, that arrow knock is, is contacting different contours of the loop. And if I ever needed to move that loop the tiniest bit from a slight shift in, in anything, I'm afraid that my arrow knock could slightly go up or down, which is going to affect my downrange impact. There is a, a, a loop style that I like to put on my own bows, and if people got the time they want, I'll put them on theirs. And, and it'll totally bulletproof that for you, where you don't ever have that issue. And it also helps you out if you ever need to replace your loop. It makes it super easy. And, and you never lose your heights or your measurements, and it wears like iron. And this, this particular little tie-in is a little tie above my arrow knock and a little tie below my arrow knock. Keeps everything extremely consistent, and, and it's, uh, it actually becomes like a molten plastic, and if you have to, you can always trim it. So um, it's a little more in detail, but I'm gonna show you how I do that now. It's, it's really simple. I'll show you just a quick, just a quick pick of one. Here's Aww. one. Here's one on my Orange Pro, my Orange Pro Comp. If you look, there's a tie-in above and below my arrow knock. Now, these spaces change given how fat the arrow knock is or what that we're shooting and all that. But these, the way I do them, I actually become a, a molten plastic 
and it's so consistent that if I ever had a loop that I needed to cut off, I could cut that loop off and put another one on above and below. It doesn't affect anything here. I've not affected my knock height. I've not affected my knock pinch. And, and this... Nathan Brooks do that too, actually. A lot of guys do. Now, now, a lot of people you'll see put a tie underneath only. If you see that, a lot of times that's a tune issue. If you just put a tie underneath, that's applying pressure down on the arrow to help keep the arrow down on the arrow rest. And, and, and that's just a different tuning effect. I like a pretty even knock tie above and below. And, um, and it's, it's served me pretty well over the years. So Sweet. we'll go ahead and we'll install one. Okay, first thing to do this, it's very simple. You need the world's cheapest super glue. I mean, go to the dollar store, <laughs> get the original cheapest, runniest super glue they got. You're going to need that. You're going to need some of the cheapest sewing thread you can find. Yes, just plain old dollar white sewing thread is great. Don't drop it on the floor. <laughs> You weren't kidding. Okay. Hey, you can drop anything you want as long as it ain't that white bow. Anyways. So, some uh, just really cheap white sewing thread is perfect. You're going to cut off about two pieces. We'll just say ah, 15 inches long, and that'll be plenty. Okay. Now, we've already made a black mark where the top of our arrow knock would have touched the bottom of the top loop knot. Okay? All I want to do is I want to come around here and I want to do just one overhand knot. Just, just the first knot in my shoelaces. I just want to do a little granny knot right there. I'm going to tie one granny knot. Okay. Now, I want to come on and I want to put a droplet of super glue over top of it. And you see that droplet of super glue will try to come around the bowstring. I'm now going to wrap over top of the bowstring. There are no knots. That super glue melts into this sewing thread. I'll come, okay, cool. basically I'm going to come up about the thickness of the old original black knot, uh, brass knocks. So I'll come up about that thickness. I'm going to give it another little droplet of super glue. Okay. Now I'm going to come back over top of the ties I just made. Okay? I'm keeping good tension on my sewing thread. Not extremely tight, just good tension. This is going to create a knock tie that will last forever and it'll just wear like iron. Now I've come all the way back down over top of it. I'm going to give it another droplet of very runny super glue. Turn the string and let it kind of soak in. I'm going to come right back over top of it again. Basically, I'm filling in the grooves that I can see. Turn the string. I let the, I let the super glue kind of come all the way around the string. I'll give it another droplet. And sometimes it's not always the prettiest ties in the world, but uh, very, very effective. And again, you can trim them. So when I've gone about as far as I think I need to go, I can just kind of hold some pressure and I'll take the original leg and I'll just, I'll just cut it off. I'll let the super glue kind of melt into the sewing thread and I'll cut the next one off. Now, the next thing I want to do is just put a droplet of super glue over it and on each side of the tie in. I'm going to turn the string, I'll let it go all the way around, take a napkin, and wipe the whole thing off. The different diameters of sewing threads will lay maybe a little tighter and different colors may lay a little different, but that gets you, that gets you a general idea there. I like to keep a little, a little towel underneath all of it so it's not falling on our, our pretty new Thank white, you. white Thank bow. You. Thank you very much. All right. Now the next thing I need is I'm going to use one of your arrow knocks to snap on below it to help me set the proper spacing. 